many times, in fact, earlier this program. Uh, last week in the Wall Street Journal, a board member on the Loudoun County School Board named John Beatty wrote a piece, Teach Respect, Not Critical Race Theory. Just some background on Loudoun County since it's got, getting so much coverage because it's a, one of the wealthiest areas in the country and because it's so close to the Beltway. Uh, some background on, you know, amid all of the back and forth sort of philosophically about the curriculum and the underlying scholarship. Uh, what is there a problem at Loudoun County in Loudoun County public schools? Before I was elected to the school board, writes Mr. Beatty, Loudoun County public schools in early 2019 spent 400 grand on an equity consultant to analyze graduation rates and other data to determine how racist the school district was. After breaking down the data by race, the consultant found tiny differences in the graduation rates of black high school students and white ones. The gaps, often only one percentage point, were not statistically significant. Yet the superintendent deemed them sufficient evidence to bring in other outside groups, which declared Loudoun County systemically racist. The administration needed to embrace race theories, uh, critical race theories, concept of equity. And then, you know, the whole thing rolled forward. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he goes, as the uh, the title of his piece indicates, concludes by saying, our children aren't racist or prejudiced. They're just kids. They need formation and guidance by treating others with respect. Even those with whom we disagree will begin to heal our schools, our countries, our counties and our country. Mm, it's a nice thought. Uh, the flip side in these times, which is a Marxist publication. I like to read the other side, too. On the same day that that op-ed was published in the Wall Street Journal, you know, they're not just lying back and letting people criticize them. Black teachers defend their curriculum from attacks on critical race theory. Milwaukee educators standing up against racist censorship of American history uh, in uh, the suburban Elmbrook schools. The proponents of critical race theory saying opponents are anti-civil rights. Now, parents in the affluent majority white school district west of Milwaukee circulated a petition calling CRT anti-faith and anti-family, alleging the district embedded CRT without the consent of the parents. And so uh, in June of this year, the school board dropped all quote unquote equity principles from its strategic plan. And now that's generating a backlash from teachers and professional race hustlers saying the school district is anti-civil rights. So, you know, uh, action, reaction, action, reaction. How does this all wind itself out or unwind itself, perhaps, is a better way to put it. For help with that, we're pleased to be joined again by William Jacobson. He is a clinical professor of law and director of the Securities Law Clinic at Cornell Law School. He's also the founder of LegalInsurrection.com, which is an excellent blog, and president of the Legal Insurrection Foundation. Professor Jacobson, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on again. Um, so, you know, sort of two interesting case studies. What's happening on Loudoun County and starting, you know, the, the actual baseline, which probably very few people know that the uh, that school board member provided. You know, this was a solution in search of a problem, essentially. And then uh, even when parents do push back and successfully, which people like me and Amy have been suggesting, uh, then, you know, then the backlash comes. So if you're successful, don't think that the other side just surrenders and then it's over. They're coming right back at you as you're, we're seeing in suburban Milwaukee. Right. I mean, there's, there's been pushback, which is legitimate to what the stories parents have been hearing and witnessing the curriculum that they've been witnessing. Uh, they've, the more they find out, the more upset they become. So th there's a real problem there. And the pushback has taken a few different forms. The pushback to the pushback. The defense of what's going on has taken a few forms. The first is, let's argue over what the meaning of critical race theory is. Okay, and so you get into these extended, particularly in the national uh, liberal media, you get into these extended discussions. Oh, well, maybe they're doing this and maybe they're doing that, but that's not actually critical race theory. Uh, and of course, who cares how you define it. It's the practices that parents are witnessing, the, you know, shaming of children by race, the focus that everything is on race, the teaching children that their skin color is the single most important thing in determining their future. It's these practices 
that are outgrowths of critical race theory. So the first thing they do is they, they want to get you in this extended argument, kind of like Bill Clinton. What is the, what is the meaning of is, okay? Um, and so that's one thing that people have to avoid. But then the other pushback is something that, you know, has been the pushback that we've known for a long time. They, they call you names. And they call you some of the worst names you can be called, like being called a racist and things like that, simply because you actually stand up for the principles of the American civil rights movement, which was that you uh, treat people based uh, on who they are as an individual and their individual you know, merits. And we all have pluses and we all have minuses. But what you don't do is you don't judge people based on the color of their skin. And that's been our highest guiding principle really since the mid-1960s. And that's out the window in a lot of these school districts. And so that's the other way that they push back. They say um, that you're, you're racist, basically. If you don't let us indoctrinate your children, you are racist. And the, the third thing they do is they say, oh, you're just against teaching history. You don't want to teach history. And, of course, that's also not true because what people object to is not the teaching of history. I haven't seen a single person who says you shouldn't teach about slavery or you shouldn't teach about Jim Crow or anything like that. But you can't distort history, and that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to make that the single defining issue in the entire history of the nation and the future of the nation uh, to the exclusion of anything good that might have happened in this country. Well, then how do you so feel? Those, that's really what you say. Yeah. How do you feel if they start teaching about George Floyd and what happened, but but hailing him as a hero instead of, you know, talking about his his criminal background and, and part making that part of the chapter or the week history of George Floyd? Well, I think, you know, it's hard, first of all, to micromanage these things. And that's what, how, what they use to their advantage. You've seen a couple of incidents recently all over the media where a couple of teachers have gone on TikTok or YouTube or wherever they went and bragged about how they're indoctrinating children. Uh, so it's hard to know what's taking place in every single classroom, but you can at least have standards. And if you're And if you're going to teach about the George Floyd case or any other criminal case or any other you know, a case like that, you should present a balanced view. Now, you can't have somebody monitoring what's said in every single classroom. That's just not practical. But you can insist on balance in whatever gets presented in the classrooms, and that's the standard that teachers need to meet, and therefore um, you have to hold them to it. But it's very hard. I mean, that's one of the things. It's very hard to be in every classroom knowing what spin various teachers are putting on it and we know because it's been documented they've bragged about it we know that there are teachers who view their role as teachers uh, essentially to be political activists it's true in higher education and it's true now in lower education in k through 12 so that's a problem that is a serious problem and i don't know that i have the answer to how you how you avoid the teachers who uh are there to, as one of them said in the Project Veritas video, he says, I think I have six months to turn them into revolution. Yeah, 180 Something days. Like right. Yeah. And now that teacher is facing termination because of the pressure that parents put on that school board. So that's a good example of, of parents uh, petitioning their school board. And it looks like uh, more likely than not, they'll get results. But I guess the question is, too, the problem now, because there's such um, reward for it, the demand for uh, racialized politics uh, is so great that they will create a supply even if even where supply doesn't exist. So, for example, Loudoun County, they don't need evidence. And if the evidence is contrary to their position, they just power right through it. So I guess my question to you is, you know, how do you see this and what do you say to parents? Just worry about your school district and putting pressure on your school district like they did in uh at Natomas in in Sacramento uh, with the Antifa teacher, just focus on trying to have the biggest impact where you can have the biggest impact, which is locally in your school district. And don't try to take on, you know, the entire American culture because the entire American culture is lost, but maybe your school district could survive or your college could survive. I think to some extent that's true. I think people need to do what they can do. And that's one of the things that pushes people into not doing anything. This is such a big problem. I can't change the world. Well, you don't have to change the world, but you know what? If you can change your elementary school and if you have a million parents changing their elementary schools and their middle schools and their high schools and their school districts, now all of a sudden you have changed the country. So my advice to parents would be get involved in your, your local school. 
run for school board, you know, run for town council, hold them accountable uh, at the state level, demand that your legislators pass legislation for transparency in schools. I mean, we have that problem in Rhode Island. You can't find out what they're doing in the school. Yeah, right. They're public records requests, and they jerk you around on that, and they want to charge you thousands of dollars. And then they sue you. Yeah. And then they sue you. I mean, we brought that at Legal Instruction, brought that case uh, forward. There. Now it's a national issue, but it started with us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so the, the, the single best thing that a state legislature could do to help parents would be a transparency law. Make sure all the curriculum is posted on the school's website. Make sure parents have access to classrooms. You can't have 10 parents in every classroom every day, but a parent, there should be a way for a parent to sit in on class and hear what's being said. Uh, transparency is the single most important thing because this battle is going to be for, fought in thousands of different schools around the country. And in fact, the National Education Association and the American Federation of Teachers have announced they want this and they want critical race theory or some variation on it in every single school in the country. And yeah. therefore, there's, you, have to, you have to be active. And there are so many parents out there. Just get involved and do what you can do. Right, but some educators you know, are telling their kids, forbidding them from discussing the curriculum and exercises with their own parents. What should happen to those teachers? Well, I think that that may not yet violate a policy, but it should. There should be those. That's part of transparency. That 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 is something that parents are entitled to know. And therefore, uh, if you had transparency laws and you had uh, laws that prohibited them from uh, hushing up students about what's going on, then that would be a policy violation. I don't know if it is yet. It's certainly a bad practice, but I think that those are the things. And, and therefore, uh, and if you can't get your state legislators, you live in a, maybe a blue state, and they're not going to do that because the teachers' unions don't want it. See if your local school board can pass a transparency provision. There's no reason they can't do it, even if the state won't mandate it. So my, my advice to parents, my urging to parents is do something, okay, because doing nothing will allow these, um, you know, national interests to push this really destructive, uh, a lot of people use the word divisive, but that's way too mild. This is extremely destructive. This pits students against each other based on the color of their skin. It pits them against their parents. It tries to separate children from parents by telling them, don't tell your parents. There was that uh, uh, school girl, I can't remember how old she was, I think she was eight or nine, who was really upset because they her mother had told her, as it should, every mother should, you can tell me anything, except at school they're telling you, don't tell your mother about critical race theory. Right. Um, it separates um, children from their country because it teaches them that somehow the U.S. is uniquely evil in history and is so evil that it can't be changed. Uh, it's so-called baked into our system. Uh, it, it really is way beyond divisive. That, that's too kind a word. It's destructive to the nation, and uh, therefore I think people need to speak up about it. Yeah, it, it, the, the, one of the issues that you're getting at is we don't have enough troops on the ground, so to speak. Uh, there was a good piece a few months back by uh, Richard Hanania, who's an academic at Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs, uh, Why Everything is Liberal. A pretty data-rich piece over at his Substack, and he just just a couple of examples. Uh, Biden and his associate committees received donations from 5.9 million people. Trump from 3.7 million people, uh, and he goes through other such examples, including the attendees to BLM marches or Occupy Wall Street, as compared to Tea Party or Trump rallies. He writes, people who engage in protesting care more about politics than people who donate money, and people who donate money care more about politics than people who simply vote. And uh, the left has a numbers advantage when it comes to the small number of people who try to influence public policy or elect- uh, electoral outcomes. That, that's true. I think that's true. And part of that is the aggressiveness in going after people who, if you donated $20. I think there was somebody recently who donated $20 to Trump, and now they were trying to get him fired from his job. I, I don't know if he was fi- fired or something like that. Um, and so, yeah, the left is extremely aggressive in scaring people away. 
And parents need to understand if they're going to stand up, they will get attacked. But at some point, you've got to stand up for your children and you've got to stand up for your community. But I totally understand it. It's a personal decision. But it's more than small donors. It's more than individuals. One of the things we've been researching is the the groups behind this national push for CRT. And it is absolutely astounding. And there is hundreds of millions of dollars flowing into this uh, area to promote these policies from the Gates Foundation to everybody else. Name brand foundations that you wouldn't have thought would be involved in this are funding groups who are pushing this. There's one group we looked into called the Future of Learning. I never heard of it, except it's a group of, it's a coalition of 300 groups pushing this stuff. Mm. They even produce a messaging guide. Every talking point you have heard uh, in terms of the defense of what's going on and the attacks on parents, parents calling them astroturf, calling them, you know, tools of the Koch brothers, all those sort of things, is in their messaging guide. And these are they, they've got about 15 or 20 major foundations funding them, 300 groups. The power in this society, contrary to what you might hear on CNN, is not with these this you know right wing dark money that you hear about. It's a, a vast um, world of left-wing funding by names of, co- of foundations that you would be shocked fund this stuff. Um, and that's really so, you know, parents are up against a lot. But the difference is there are parents who this is the issue, and this is what scares Democrats so much. This is the issue where people really are willing to get involved. And we're seeing that around the country. And that's why they're trying to demonize it, just like they did the Tea Party movement uh, by calling it AstroTurf, et cetera, because they realize this is one that could hurt them. This is one that hits very close to home for people because it affects their children's education. I mean, my goodness, if, if your child is being taught that, you know, I'm showing your proof in math um, should not be done because it's a, an attribute of white supremacy. I mean, what could be worse than that? There is not a, a, an ethnic group or a racial group where the parents don't want their kids to be taught math properly, okay? Uh, so this, this, is, this cuts across the racial divide that people try to create. This cuts across the ethnic divide. Uh, if you notice in a lot of these towns and school districts, the people at the forefront speaking up against these policies are Asian Americans, uh, it's happening in Boston. It's happening in Loudoun County uh, because this curriculum they're pushing and this methodology they're pushing of so-called equity uh, is is openly intended to minimize the number of Asian students who get into elite public high schools. So this is an issue that scares them terribly because it cuts across racial groups, it cuts across ethnic groups, and it's very personal to parents. And uh, that's why they're they're hitting so hard on it. And uh, your, all your talk about foundations behind critical race theory, I mean, it's, it calls to mind, again, a British historian Robert Conquest's second law of politics. Any organization not explicitly or constitutionally right-wing will eventually become left-wing, and that's what you've seen with some of those name-brand foundations yep. that you're, you're referencing. He is uh, Professor William Jacobson, clinical professor of law and director of the Securities Law Clinic at Cornell Law School, founder of LegalInsurrection.com, LegalInsurrection.com. You should check it out regularly and president of the Legal Insurrection Foundation. Professor Jacobson, thanks for joining us again. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. It's like a hot steaming cup of information to start your day.